Hey, so re quick review. Chapters 1 and 2, we saw the state of Israel, that their sin was so great, God describes it as a weight or a burden to, the, to God at the end of chapter 2. And one of the things we found out there was that justice was being perverted, right? Things that should be right are not right because there was an ulterior motive. Somebody wanted money, and they were abusing other people to get what they wanted. Uh, chapters 3 and 4, God's judgment was pronounced, and we kind of looked at why God was doing this. Well, part of it was the fact that they had really made some bad decisions, and the consequences of their decisions were being brought out. And then another thing, God was bringing <laughs> some bad things onto them because he was trying to get their attention. He wanted them to repent. You know, God's goal, I think, well, I don't think, I know, for all of our lives is that we're to be right with him. And he uses different ways to get our attention. Uh, you know, some of us sometimes are just a little thick-headed, right? I can remember a lot of times I'd pray to the Lord, Lord, just really, I need like a cricket bat upside the head, so I'll get it. Right? Because sometimes it's right in front of your face, and you're like, oh, that's not me, right? So chapter 5 begins with a song, a lamentation, verses 1 and 2. Hear the word which I take up against you, a lamentation, O house of Israel. The virgin of Israel has fallen. She will rise, or she, yeah, she will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. There is no one else to raise her up. Now, this sad song is of a young girl who, uh, it appears, has no one to protect her, no one to help her. But now remember, this is Israel, so why? Well, this young girl has rebelled. And in this lamentation of Amos, her life that should have been long, that should have been pro prosperous, is now ending in her youth. Verse 3 says, For thus says the Lord God, The city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which goes out by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. Again, we got some analogies going on here. So if you send a thousand guys out to fight, it's going to be like only having a hundred. If you send a hundred out to fight, it's only going to be like having ten. And we see something here that we have seen throughout. We looked at it a little more in detail last week, but this reaping and sowing principle. See, if you invest in good things, well, then the Bible says you will reap good things. If you invest in bad things, then look out. Trouble's coming. Now, this principle was actually established for Israel as a step of faith. In Leviticus chapter 25, verses 3 and 4, God gives them, the Israel, this instruction. He says, Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. Right? We understand that. But the seventh year be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land. A Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. See, this principle of faith had to actually be put into practice. Following God's instruction and trusting that he will provide for what is needed. Six years, you're working the land and reaping its produce. And then the seventh year, God says, no. You let the land rest. Now, Understand that Israel never followed this instruction. One of the reasons, and the main reason, that they were in exile for 70 years is because they did not let the land rest. Now, we think of that and we go, well, that sounds like it wouldn't be that difficult. But think about this for a moment. Let's say you work your job for six years, and then God says, on the seventh year, I want you to take off and trust that I will provide. I will give you all you need 
in year six to provide for year seven. Yeah, let's do it. And then we're a month into it and we see lack. And we think, oh, we need maybe to do something. See, that, that's an interesting faith step, isn't it? But yet reaping and sowing, that's really what it is. If I'm sowing to the Lord, then I'm trusting that if I do what he says, something good is going to come out of it because he said so. Now, if you want to read that whole story, Leviticus chapter 12, 25, it's really, really uh, an interesting read about how God promised that he would be faithful to his people. So back to Israel here. What needs to happen with all this prophetic warning of coming judgment? What needs to happen for Israel is repentance. Verse 4, for thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. Now again, there's an implication here. Israel is not seeking the Lord, and they're not living. Now, Jesus gave us a little glimpse about this principle. Turn in your Bible to John chapter 10. Now, Jesus tells us that if we follow him, if we trust him, if we're obedient to him, something is going to happen. Let's start in verse 7. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. See, the follower of Jesus that isn't living an abundant life, something might be wrong, right? Right? Now, if we hold on to the premise that God is who he says he is and God's word is true, then is it God's fault that I'm not living an abundant life or is it mine, right? See, something needs attention. And in this simple verse from Amos, we got to ask ourselves a question. Am I seeking the Lord in everything? See, Israel was not. So what are they seeking? Verse 5. But do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall, be, shall come to nothing. So there's three cities here uh, in Israel that have what we would might call historical significance. So l let's review one of these a minute. See, Bethel is where God met Jacob. In, in Genesis chapter 28... Remember, Jacob was sleeping on a rock, and he has this dream, and he sees this vision of angels coming up and down this ladder. And God spoke to him, and he said, listen, the land that you're resting on, I have given to you. It's the same land I gave your granddad, and it's the same land I gave your dad. You need to possess this land. See, Genesis th chapter 35 in Bethel, it's the same place that Jacob was told by God to build an altar and to worship God and God only. Gilgal was where God cleansed Israel of the reproach of Egypt. We're going to answer what that is uh, in just a second. So here's what happened. Joshua chapter 5 verses 1 through 12 40 years in the wilderness have passed. This old generation has passed on. They've entered into the promised land. They're, getting, they're surrounded by enemies. They've had some victories. And God says something, gives Joshua some really, really interesting instruction about this younger generation that has come up. He says, these people have not been circumcised. I want you to circumcise them. Now, um, without getting too graphic, 
you know, for that happening to an older man, I don't think uh, I would want to experience that, uh, let alone knowing that that would probably enable me to some degree or disable me to some degree and our enemies around, and they probably wouldn't be able to fight, right? But they, choose, they chose to trust the Lord and they followed through with obedience, See, all throughout the wilderness, aside from the people that left Egypt, there was no circumcision. So we have to understand then, what is this reproach of Egypt? Well, see, they had shame. They had shame because they were slaves. And they are no longer slaves of Egypt. They are now children of God in God's promised land. See, this is their new identity. See, circumcision, cutting away the flesh for us here in this day. See, the Lord wants to cut away the flesh. He wants to get rid of some things in our lives so that we can walk in the Spirit, right? Beersheba. Uh, this was the connection of actually Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Genesis chapter 1 is where a Abraham made a covenant of peace with the king of the Philistines, Abimelech. He planted this tamarisk tree, and it was supposed to represent the pact that Abraham and the and, uh, Philistines had. Genesis 26, God spoke to Isaac in this same location, reminding Isaac of the land given to Abraham that was now his, not Esau's, his brother. Genesis 46, God also told Jacob in Beersheba to go to Egypt. Why? Well, remember there was famine in the land. Joseph's there. Uh, miraculously, Joseph has the uh, wisdom to store up enough food for this time of famine. So Jacob and all of his family move and they inhabit Egypt, and they stay there for 400 years. And he says, I, he promises something. He says, I will make you a great nation there. And that's actually what happened. So these cities for Israel, though, the northern kingdom became a point of reference for their religious system. See, they didn't focus on the Lord. They focused on other things, like these cities. And Amos says that these cities will come to nothing. Your faith and your trust and your motivation because of these cities is not where that needs to be. Verse 6, Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it with no one to quench it in Bethel. You who turn justice to wormwood and lay righteousness to the rest to rest in the earth. See, the thing that will change the judgment of God coming down on Israel is repentance, seeking the Lord and living. The cities that they honor so much will not save them. God's fire of judgment will devour their misplaced faith. Why? Because they've corrupted their legal system and they've made justice nothing, wormwood. Wormwood is worthless. Being right with God was of no importance to them. Righteousness in the nation, he says, is dead. Verse 8. Now he changes. He's, he's telling us about God. He says, he made the uh, Pleiades and Orion. He turns the shadow of death into morning and makes the day dark as night. He calls the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. He rains ruin upon the strong so that the fury comes upon the fortress. See, Amos stops for a moment and explains why God is worthy to be honored, why he's worthy to be praised, why God is worthy to be loved, and why God is worthy to be obeyed. So I thought, well, why is he, you know, now, this is three, 4,000 years ago. Why is he referencing the Pleiades and Orion? 
two constellations. So I thought, I'm going to just do a little homework on these constellations, and I found out some cool stuff. Not a lot, but just a few things. So the Pleiades, that constellation is 444 light years away, and it is actually one of the nearest clusters of stars to our galaxy. Hmm. Orion. Right, Orion the hunter, we can see him certain times of the year. Specific, I wanted to look at his belt. Specifically his belt, it's made up of three stars. Uh, the first one is called the Alnitak. That star is 800 light years away, and that star is 100,000 times brighter than our sun. The, Aln the Alnilum, Number two is 2,000 light years away. Uh, its ultraviolet light is 375,000 times brighter than our sun. And the last one, Menaka, 950 light years away. And it is actually a double star that orbits, they orbit each other every 5.73 days. I mean, it's pretty cool stuff. I mean, I don't have a microscope, but, you know, a lot of smart guys have figured this out. This star is 91,000 times brighter than our sun. And Amos reminds the people, says, listen, God makes that. He created that. He is worthy. Verse 10. They hate the one who rebukes at the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. So now remember, the gate of the city was where uh, decisions were made. The leadership of the city hung out. If people had a dispute, they would come to the gate of the city. And Amos is telling us that anyone that is trying to stand up for what is right in the gates is hated and rejected. Sounds about like today, doesn't it? Verse 11, therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses and hewn stone, and yet you shall not dwell in them, you have planted pleasant vineyards, and you shall not drink wine from them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. You see what he's saying about their sin? Manifold transgressions. Mighty sins. I don't know that I want that on my resume, right? See, the same reasons that were previously given in earlier chapters as to why God's judgment is coming upon Israel. They take advantage of the poor. The weak do not have a voice. The rich take bribes, punishing and pushing justice, I'm sorry, further away from the culture. It's just about what they want. And there is no justice for the less fortunate. You know, you've been in a, probably, I think everyone has in some time of their life, you've been in a position where justice was not served. Right? You may have been accused of something you did not do and everything comes against you, and it appears that nobody is concerned about finding out what is right. They just want to find somebody to blame so they can move on. Verse 13, Therefore the prudent keep silence at the time, for it is an evil time. The godly and the righteous are silent. And I have to ask a question. Well, is it because uh, they feared retaliation? Is it because they just came to the conclusion that for themselves, their voice wouldn't make a difference? Have those, those thoughts crossed your mind before? But Amos, this guy who wasn't trained as a prophet, who's a sheep breeder and a fruit picker, is called by the Lord and his voice is making a difference. Let's pick up in verse 14. The host will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So the instruction, seek good, love good, 
the solution to the sin in Israel? Well, I think we could kind of narrow it down to this sentence, making right choices. See, do you want to live? Do you want the Lord to be with you? Okay, then, seek good things. Are you tired of a corrupt justice system? Do you want the Lord's blessing and his grace on your life? Well, then hate evil and love what is good. And if you choose not to change, there will be consequences. Verse 16, therefore the Lord God of hosts, the Lord says this, there shall be wailing in all streets and they shall say in all the highways, alas, alas, they shall call the farmer to mourning, the skillful lamenters to wailing. In all vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through you, says the Lord. See, the Lord coming and passing through us should be a good thing. It's not a good thing here. The sin of the nation, he mentions the farmer, and then he mentions so the lower class and the upper class, because he mentions something that I find is a really odd kind of cultural thing for Jewish people. Uh, we, we see it in the New Testament a little bit. You know, if you're grieved so much, you know, you, you're, you're just brokenhearted, that you think you need to grieve more, so you pay people to come and cry for you. Isn't that just the weirdest thing? I just can't cry enough. I know that if I pay a few friends, they'll come over and cry with me, right? Well, that's what's going on here. <laughs> There's going to be wailing, and there's going to be wailers wailing, but it's not just going to be because somebody paid them. It's going to be because God is passing through the people, bringing on judgment, and it's going to be a heartache to everyone. Verse 18, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, for what good is the day of the Lord to you? Now, it's the people in Israel are desiring the day of the Lord. We've got to understand something. If we were to travel back in time to Israel, the city of Samaria, at this time, we would find something probably very interesting. We could walk the streets of the city and probably randomly ask people, uh, excuse me, but who's your God? And they would answer, oh, it's Jehovah. But, but what about Baal worship that's going on over there? Oh, no, 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 that's not our God. Right? See, that would be the answer. But the problem is, is when you would start asking personal questions. But do you worship Jehovah? Well, see, whatever they said really wouldn't matter because their lifestyle doesn't match what they think they believe. See, people think that the day of the Lord is the day when God will bring his mercy. Clearly not understanding that in this text, the day of the Lord, God will judge their sin. See, they are in so much sin that they think their lifestyle is okay. Now, think about this today in the church as a whole, the people of God. One thing that is going on throughout is that we love to talk about God bringing unity and God bringing love, right? And those are really good things. But there's one thing that we fail to talk about, sin. God wants to deal with our sin, why? So we'll repent. Right? and get right with him so that love and unity can flow. Israel thinks things are great. They're wanting the day of the Lord to come, but they do not understand what they are asking for. Asking for. Amos's words are foreign to them. They don't get it. Verse 19, it will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into his house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent and bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is not very dark? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it at all? See, darkness and light here are not referring necessarily to evil and good, but it's referring to disaster compared to safety. 
You come into a, t a lion attack and <laughs> you get away, and boom, you turn around, a bear nails you, right? <laughs> Or you go into your house and you think everything is safe and okay, and then you kind of, oh, man, it's been a tough day. Snake comes out and bites you, right? That's not good things. That's not safety. See, things, what is happening here in Israel is things are going from bad to worse. Verse 21, I hate, I despise your feast days. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fatted peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. Now again, travel back in time. These people are taking total offense to Amos' words. See, they think they're doing all the right things, right? The burnt offerings, the peace offerings, singing and playing their instruments. God is so good, right? But Amos says that to the Lord, it means nothing. Why? See, all of this pomp and circumstance of cer ceremony is an offense to the Lord. Why? Because they're going through the religious motions. Their lifestyle does not match what they think is godly and it's sin to God. They take advantage of the poor. The weak don't have a voice. The rich take bribes, pushing justice further away from culture, and there's no justice at all for the less fortunate. Now, do you remember when King David got caught in his sin with Bathsheba? Now, understand what I said. He got caught. See, David didn't go and confess. Nathan the prophet comes to him and puts his finger in his face and says, Dude, you're the man. You have sinned against the Lord. Then David repented. Now, for a time, he was going through the religious motions, hiding his sin. And then God revealed it. In Psalm chapter 51, this is a song that David wrote after this confrontation. In verse 16 and 17, David says something really interesting. He says, For you, God, do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Now understand, in this time, the covering of sin was an animal sacrifice. And David is putting it out there for everybody. Listen, that is not what God is about. He's about relationship with you. Your heart being right. Not about the things you do. See, sadly, there are always going to be people who think that what they do is more important than who they are. Verse 24. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. See, a trickle of justice will not do. Justice needs to flow. You know, when we get to the prophet Micah, a few books from now, he will give the same message to Jerusalem for their abuse of justice and their, their abuse to the poor. And God sums up his message to the people with an interesting verse. Turn to Micah chapter 6. Of mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Do what is right, love mercy, and be humble before the Lord. Now, I think sometimes we get the first two twisted a little bit. I know guys sometimes do this. I know in my mind, I, here's what I end up doing. I want to do a little mercy, and I really love justice, right? And we want to see people that you're going to pay for what you have done, to me, right? 
See, justice here is something that we should do, but we are to love mercy. See, mercy is sometimes the last thing we want to give to people. But boy, we sure do want it from the Lord. And think about it. Until we decide to be humble, it's really difficult to do the other two. Verse 25. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? You carried Sekuth, your king, and Chun, your idols, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Now, this is an interesting observation about something that happened for 40 years. 40 years in the wilderness, we thought, well, I mean, didn't Israel worship God exclusively? See, there's two words here, these gods. Sekuth meaning king, and Chuan meaning shrine. If we look at the Greek Septuagint, they translated this as the tabernacle of Molech. It's a rather hard thing to believe that after God's deliverance out of Egypt, now think about this, all of those plagues, right? And you're led out of Egypt, and the people want you to leave so bad they're giving you stuff, right? Giving you gold. Just take this and get out of here. And you start walking. We're finally set free. And then you get stuck in this area where there's no way out. Rocks on both sides and water. And you turn around and see, wait a minute, Pharaoh changed his mind. His army is behind us, right? Moses, <laughs> what did you do to us? Right? And, and that guy with the stick, right? <laughs> holds it up. The Red Sea parts. Everybody passes through. Moses then, a few weeks later, goes up on the mountain. He's gone for 40 days hearing from the Lord. You've gone through all of that. And I don't think Moses is coming back. Maybe we should make a golden cow and worship the cow. Yeah, that's a good idea. And then 40 years of worshiping other idols. Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 16. Joshua writes, Now therefore fear, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers that served them where they were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. Lip service. And do it. Now we can look at that and go, Man, sure I'm glad I'm not like them. We are sometimes, aren't we? Yeah. It may not be so blatant is, you know, I go to your house, you ask me over for dinner, for tacos, and, you know, your height, your fireplace mantle, and you go, oh, here's my little idols that I worship. Right? That's pretty blatant, right? But there are things that we can see in people's lives that really show us what is important to them, what they worship, right? Look at your financial statement, where are you spending your money, right? Is it all about you or is it something else? Right? The Bible says something interesting about our heart. He says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
And you know what's really interesting that comes out of the heart? There's an emotion that reveals some things. Anger. And all kinds of nasty things come out when we're angry if our heart is full of things it shouldn't be full of. See, we can look at Israel and go, oh, man, if I had walked through the sea parting, man, I would follow God forever. I don't know. Right? I mean, in, in our society today in church, we're, we're looking for, you know, that Sunday where some big super spiritual, supernatural thing happens. Oh, man, that was awesome. And then two days later, we're doing things we shouldn't be doing. See, one of the interesting things that the Old Testament shows us is that a miracle from God doesn't necessarily change my life. See, what changes my life is that I understand how much he loves me, and I just want to love him back. And then we're humble, right? Right? And we start seeking the Lord and doing what is right, what is good. Verse 27. Therefore, I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, of, uh, who, says the Lord whose name is God of hosts. Chapter 6. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria. Notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. See, J Jerusalem now he's nailing with Samaria. They're, all, they're both guilty. And he says they're at ease. All of the good in the land, all the good things that are going. Now remember, we talked when we first started about this book and the book of, of Joel is that financially, militarily for Israel right now, things are really awesome. But spiritually, they're a mess. They're dying. We might call this ease that they're talking about a fleshly security, right? Well, today I feel good and my emotions are right and things seem good, so I'm at ease, right? And then there's some things we just don't want to deal with. But God loves us so much, he goes, no, 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 I want to deal with something. Your territory? So a comparison is going on here. God asked Israel to compare themselves to these other cities that God has already brought judgment on. See, the Israel thinks, well, we aren't as bad as they are. Right. But sin is sin. And God thinks, listen, their sin was really great, and I brought judgment on them. Don't think that just because you're not, your sin isn't as great that I won't bring judgment. I will. Verse three: Woe to you who put off the, uh, who put off far off the day of doom, who cause the seed of violence to come near, who lie on the beds of ivory, stretch out your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but are not grieved. For the affliction of Joseph. Now this ease is first, that he mentions in verse 1, their sinful ease is shown by a couple of things here. I'm not going to look at them in detail, but I think they're summed up in three words. Procrastination. They're putting off the judgment that is coming, this day of doom. They're like, oh, I, you know, that doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm okay. Do you ever think that sometimes we think we're okay and we're probably not? Right? Injustice. They're living a life of luxury when the poor around them don't have enough. And it's just pride. This self of love, love of self, I'm sorry, and being careless, right? Just doing whatever they want to do. Verse 7, therefore they shall go... Uh, they shall now go to captivity as the first of the captives, and those who recline at banquets shall be removed. Now remember, Israel, the northern kingdom, Judah's the southern kingdom. Israel is going to be the first to fall. Forty years from now, Assyria, or 30 years from now, Assyria will come in and occupy them, and then another 10 years, they're gone. They'll take them all out. Verse 8. 
The Lord God has sworn by himself. The Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. See, pride is not a good thing. God doesn't like it. He hates pride as much as he hates their sinful lifestyle. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, Peter's given some advice. He says, likewise, you younger people, right? So anybody that's younger than me, listen. Submit yourselves to your elders. Ooh, didn't want to hear that, Kenny. Thanks. And then he says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another, right? It means be accountable. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. You know this resist, it's a military term, like I'm holding you back. Right? You're not getting close. I don't think anybody here, I don't think anybody that is thinking clearly would say, you know what? I don't want to be at arm's length with God. I want to be as close to him as I can be, right? But God says pride does that. Our pride. Now this is Peter writing. Where, where do you think Peter learned that principle? Right? God, every, everybody else will deny you, but not me. <laughs> Verse 9. Then it shall come to pass that if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. And when a relative of the dead with no one, uh, with one who will burn the bodies, picks up the bodies to take them out of the house, he will say to one outside the house, are there any more with you? Then someone will say none. And then he will say, hold your tongue, for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. I had to read that thing five times. Like, what are you talking about? What does this mean? Now understand, God's pronouncing his judgment, and he's saying that when judgment comes, people will be so afraid of the judgment that they won't even speak the name of the Lord because they think something else is gonna, bad is going to happen to them. Now, this is a sad misconception of who God is. See, the misconception is from man, us, and it's from the enemy. We think that sometimes we may have gone too far and God won't save us, right? Have you ever thought that? Don't raise your hands. You know, you, I, I, I've, I've done too much. There's no way God could love me. There's no way. You don't know what I've done, right? I understand that's pride. But there's people that think that. See, the enemy tells us, he'll whisper in your ear, hey, you I know what you did. There is no way God wants you. You think if all your people around you, if your friends knew what you had done, you think they're going to accept you? Why do you think God would? Where did we come up with that? Why do we listen to that? See, sadly, there's been something that has been forgotten with people that want to have a relationship with the Lord. They don't read this book. They don't understand who God is and God's character. And there's something about him that's different that you and I really find it hard to comprehend, that he loves us and that he will forgive us. And the moment that I ask for forgiveness, everything changes. Please, do not live your life, your life in Jesus, with your past hanging over your head. Here's what we have to understand. We need to own our mistakes. We need to be responsible for our actions and allow the blood of Jesus to cover our sin. Remember when John, John the Baptist, came on the scene and then Jesus came on later? You know what the first things they said? Repent, right? 
for the kingdom of God is at hand. And everybody thought that, oh, the Messiah's come. He's going to establish his rule and reign on this earth. And everything will be better. And Jesus was, they missed it, right? See, that's going to happen. You know, I, I kind of mentioned it Sunday when we talked about these things that the Bible still talks about. When we talk about the millennial reign of Christ, if you want to read chapter 20 of Revelation, you'll find out clearly there is a thousand years of a millennial reign. And here's why. Because God keeps his promises. And he promised Israel that they would have their king on the throne and live under physically under God's reign for a thousand years. See, spiritual renewal can take place when we bow our knee to Jesus. And bowing our knee means we got to deal with our sin. Verse 11, all these nice homes that they've acquired by robbing people, they're gone. In fact, the little houses, they're going to be gone too. Verse 12, do horses run on rocks? Does one plow with, there with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into gall and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. Now, think about this. If you get on a horse and you ride through rocks, you are not going to have a good experience. You are going to hurt the horse. Just like if you hook a big ox up to a plow and try to run it through a bunch of rocks, you're really not going to accomplish anything. See, the end game for Israel's injustice and lack of righteousness, even though there's this financial gain at this moment, the end game is useless. It amounts to nothing. Verse 13, you who rejoice over Lodabar, who say, have we not taken uh, Carnaim for ourselves by our own strength? Now, again, this is one of those verses that really doesn't make any sense. Well, Lodabar is a word, it's a place, but it means nothing, right? Carnaim means horns, right? Horns were a symbol of strength. So what Amos is saying to him, he's kind of jabbing him a little bit. He goes, listen, you guys think you've done something really awesome, but it's nothing. And you think you've got this strength, but there's nothing there. Israel believes they've had victory and strength in their current actions, and it is not victory. Verse 14, but behold, I will raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, says the Lord God of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the valley of Arbah. Arbah. God will ju God's judgment on Israel will come from a conquering nation, Assyria from Hamath, which is a fortress up north, to Arabah, which is down south by the Dead Sea, nothing will be left. Now, something interesting happens in chapters nine, or 7, 8, and 9. Amos will now write down some visions that God has given him. And... Tell you what, turn, turn to chapter 7. Let's look at, um, look at the first couple of verses. Because some, some of this has been kind of heavy, hadn't it? It's just like, oh, man, God judges sin, and man, they don't repent, and man, all this blah, 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 right? But something interesting happened. Let's, let's go to uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, or thus the Lord God showed me, right? So God shows Amos something. Behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. And so it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land, the locusts, they've eaten everything, that I said, stop right there. So after this first mowing, so remember the first part of it went to the king. Who's the first part of, uh, of the fruit and the harvest supposed to go to? God. No, it's going to the king. God said, listen, the king's going to get his share. 
and then there's going to be nothing left, right? This is this vision. Now, this, this is locust. This isn't what we read about in Joel. This is something that hasn't happened yet. The end of verse 2, he says, O oh Lord God, forgive, I pray. Oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, says the Lord. God shows Amos a vision of another disaster that's going to happen. And Amos, one guy does something that changes everything. He prays and asks for forgiveness. And God says, okay, I'll do it. How cool is that? Now listen, do you think if God will use the prayer of a fruit-picking sheep breeder to change something for the nation that your prayers matter? Okay, but look at, look at the next one. Verse 4. Thus says the Lord, thus the Lord God showed me, behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory, right? A fire's coming, it's got to wipe everything out. Then I said, O oh Lord God, cease, I pray. Oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. Verse 6, look. So the Lord relented concerning this. Thus also shall not be, says the Lord God. This one guy that was called by the Lord, he wasn't trained, no experience. He just was obedient to the Lord. And after all of this that the Lord's given, the Lord starts showing him some visions of some things that are going to happen. And he goes, oh, Lord, please don't. Please, I pray. That's it. Okay, because you prayed, I'm not going to do it. 